Hi everyone, welcome to the next live stream. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I hope everyone's having a wonderful Friday and everyone's keeping safe as well. Yes, check out. Awesome. So I know a bunch of you guys um, dropped some portfolio links on Discord. Um, we gave them a review and it works really, really nice. I decided just to kind of shoot for that this live stream and start kind of just, you know, checking that out and just providing a lot of kind of just insight real time. Um, yeah, so without further ado, let's get started. So the first one's from Shayla Rose um, in Oxford, United Kingdom. Um, she is an environment artist and she like some really, really good work to start with. Um, but I feel like I definitely from reviewing it, I could see a lot of just kind of general um, feedback areas that I can just kind of go over in the live stream. So the first one is the reading room. Um, overall, the presentation is really nice and the lighting is really good. Um, I can see the total tri scan for this is 38k and with texture maps from 2k to 512. Recreation four days, original project of two days. I mean, for honestly, four days of work, this is really, really good. And I can see from looking at this that um, she probably utilized a lot of um, mid poly work. Um, I mean, yeah, it looks wonderful. So, to start, I did notice I was reviewing the geometry and i noticed that the kind of the frame was very dense and um, i mean it, i suppose it all just depends on like if this was like a player in this world like how close that person would get to that if they're super close i mean you could probably have some of it in the gel like the geometry and silhouette but i would probably bake a lot of that detail down into normal map you know you could have kind of just like the sides just the top um, I mean, I feel like it reads really well, but I probably would have done that instead of having it all as completely as geometry. Um, an alternative would be just baking a height map and just using like tessellation or like a bump map just to kind of push it out. And the other thing that kind of stood out to me was I noticed that um, the texture books or the book textures, so I know they're like, these are all like basically like 512 textures. So I'm thinking because like there is a lot of it, the, these books on screen, and they do take up a lot of the kind of real estate in the environment. And um, it is good to keep them at high quality. So I can see why you kind of shoot it for like a 512 per book. But the issue with this is if you think about the amount of books that you're using versus the amount of texture sets you have, that's a lot for the engine to call and draw calls. So if it was me, I probably would have tried to shoot for like a, maybe a, like three sets of 4K or even 2K textures and just kind of um, seeing how much you could squeeze into each of those of these books. You know, maybe if like certain books don't have size visible, you know, so maybe some a bunch of them have the front, but there's not really any visible on like the side. You could have either A, just um, decrease the UV island space of maybe like side sections and kept the back section like in the, the resolution quite high on the UVs. Um, that probably would have allowed you to kind of create a 4K texture, squeeze everything in and still have it looking pretty solid without having to pay for multiple 512 draw calls. Um, an alternative would be doing like a high poly and then kind of creating like a bunch of books. So maybe like four or five books and having a kind of set up where, oh, there's, um, you know, this is the geometry and the shape of it. And you just basically bake it down as one mesh and it just have all the normal detail do all the work for you and that could be an alternative option to it you know so you're not having to pay for like the faces in between you're only paying for just like the front sections the sides of visible to the player and maybe other kind of silhouette changes and i mean if you're placing these books as well hand by hand i would probably it would actually be a lot cheaper to have like this cabinet mesh you know, either A, have the books as a part of the mesh, or B, have X amount of books attached as a single mesh. It just reduces the draw calls, because I just feel like if, if a lot of these guys are their own asset and you're placing them in scene, plus each of them are pulling in a 512 texture set, it's just a lot of draw calls that are being used for that. And it's just a good way just to really save on those details. Um, but I mean, I think for like the amount of assets in this scene, the composition is really, really nice. I'd say I'd probably watch out for the root grain as well on the front of the shelving unit. It just feels very noisy and I feel like you might have been able to get away with just maybe 
reducing that just a little bit. Um, you know, maybe kind of straightening it out, not having the lines as like kind of quivery. Um, yeah, I mean, otherwise it, it looks really, really good. And I think when it comes to like, you know, when you're working on this kind of stuff, just always make sure that your wood grain is flowing the right direction. Um, it's something I used to struggle with at the start. And I think, you know, from this time that it's been something now that I really kind of think about whenever I'm creating anything that has wood grain. You know, and I can see again here, we can see like there's a lot of really nice details. And, you know, if the player is getting very close to it, you know, I can see why the silhouette would matter. But, you know, if you think of like Resident Evil Village and other games, a lot of this detail is just basically baked down onto a normal map. And you just kind of use the additional geometry to just kind of smoothen out the edges of the frame. Just anywhere that kind of maybe from an angle, the player will see that detail. And I think the candles are really, really nice. Like the skull sort just beautiful on that so honestly that looks wonderful um yeah and your sofa meshes look great as well i'd say the only thing that kind of stand out to me is if you think about maybe someone sitting on this you know you're probably going to get some slight discoloration where they've been kind of putting pressure on the fabric or maybe just some roughness variation so i probably would have added just a bit more of a lived in feel on these guys you know they feel very new very fresh you know you can see kind of the light reflecting off the, the fabric material I'd probably kind of just add some kind of slight coloration differences and maybe some darker kind of reds and browns and you know kind of in brought in kind of the roughness detail a bit more on like this sitting section and the section where they dress their arms and um, it just would feel just a lot more lived in and more real as well I think everything else looks really nice though like I really like the presentation I like the lighting um, I guess what would be really cool is sort of like if this was done in Unreal, having kind of a setup where, you know, maybe you could add like extra decals and stuff for details. So just maybe like some dirt between kind of the wood and the, the wallpaper and some general just staining, maybe some staining on the ground as well. You know, maybe the carpet section. You know, I guess the few questions I would have looking at this is, you know, is the carpet, is that geometry? Is it a flat decal texture? It's just, it's very hard to kind of read from this angle. And um, I probably would have done the same for, uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Yeah, I mean, the, the beauty of using decals is you can basically have a basic scene and you can go in and just plaster your decals on it with like different details. And it just really brings that scene to life and it's a very non-destructive workflow, so you don't have to worry about vertex painting. Because um, as we know with vertex painting, it can get very costly if you're adding additional wire, like edge loops to wall sections and, you know, and you're using multiple shaders in Unreal where decals are just, they're very cheap, very small in memory, and you can just get away with just having a lot of them. I really like the translucency you have of the curtains as well. I think that reads really, really nice. Um, I guess this background section, is that just, is that a skybox? Is it just a picture? I'd be curious to kind of know your approach for that part. Other than that, your other frames are really, really nice. I mean, like, the quality is there, the presentation is there. I just feel with those little kind of adjustments, it would just really kind of hit, make this hit the next level. And maybe like even a further breakdown of the assets. So maybe like you have this guy here, so then maybe you could have like, instead of like this wireframe shot, you have maybe multiple render presentations in Marmoset or on rail of the assets themselves. So like you have the sofa and then you have like multiple angles, you know, and then maybe there's like one that just has like the wireframe over it, highlighted over it, you know, but like the triscan. And maybe even like the UV layout as well, you know, because it would give people an idea of kind of how you approach your UVs and how you kind of optimize them and if you optimize them and just sort of, you know, do you keep it all one-to-one -one or do you kind of scale areas up that are more visible and other areas down? I just feel like a lot of those things would just help studios really get an insight to kind of how you approach those things. And um, as, you know, I suppose when it comes to picking like um, potential candidates and stuff, it's just, it's really good to have high quality art on your portfolio. But if you're trying to get in as like an intern or a junior, it's just very important to kind of have a lot of that stuff on screen. 
So the carp's flat decal basically was in plan, but I had to bring the okay. So I'd probably if I was to redo it, or if if you have this scene at hand, um, I would probably go in and just create this as a high poly. You know, add kind of those like nice fabric folds. Maybe have like a section that's sort of like creased up, or maybe like an like you know like a side section of it is kind of like on over. Um, it would just give it so much more life. Plus, it just means that because when you look at it really close, you can almost kind of see like the resolution of it is a lot less compared to everything else in scene. Um, and I feel like because the rest of your scene is done so well that that would just really pull back from kind of just the quality and detail, you know, that you're presenting. So I think if you were just to spend a wee bit more time, just kind of giving things a bit more polish, you know, just polishing up the carpet, maybe, you know, these guys here, you know, I can see that it's very much like a high to low. But if I was you, I'd probably go in and just give the stuff just another pass, just to kind of bring the level up a wee bit more. And honestly, this would be an absolute solid portfolio piece. But otherwise, I mean, for, you know, four days work, it's, it's really, really, really good. Like it definitely is up there. But yeah, awesome. Is it bad just to have one really good portfolio piece in the June portfolio? So I would say um, when it comes to portfolios, quality over quantity is very important. So, you know, two or three really, really solid portfolio pieces will sell you, you a lot better than six or seven half completed portfolio pieces. Because I think I think the saying goes that your best work is as good as your worst or something like that. It just means that if you have like really solid stuff and then you have like a not so good thing, it can kind of just wash out the quality of your work, your like your presentation in the portfolio. Um, I think it's so important when you're doing this stuff just to really kind of specialize in a specific area, you know. So if environments is what you love doing or hard surface art, just really focus in on that and obsess over that and just get to the best you can possibly be at it because there's always going to be people who can do cart or can do concept art, can do all the other areas. And in the games industry, a generalist doesn't really exist. You know, so it's very much like, I mean, it's great if you're an environment artist, but you enjoy doing concept art in your free time, but the chances of you being asked to do concept art in the studio is very minimal. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's usually what I kind of go for is just, you know, whenever you start creating art for games, you'll find your niche, you'll find something that works and you'll be like, oh, I really enjoy this. And then you'll find yourself naturally swaying to that anytime you go to create something. And that's usually when you know, okay, this, this is what I need to do. This is what I need to focus on. Does that advice of super special and outside smaller studios? So primarily for AAA, although, I mean, it depends on the size of the indie studio. I mean, sometimes startups were kind of, they would very much um, have multiple hats. You know, I mean, that can very much kind of be like, if you're the environment art, um, that could cover just even like technical aspect of environment art or just optimization. You know, maybe they might say, hey, can you make a shotgun or handgun for a game? But typically it's very much um, better just to be specifically focused on a specific area because it's just, I feel like with the amount of heads that are on a AAA game, there'll always be people there to cover needs of X, Y, or Z. And the thing is, you're always going to be working alongside probably the best in the industry. So the more that you can kind of focus and specialize in a specific area, the chances are that you'll probably climb to be one of the best at that area. And I mean, for myself, I personally specialize in environment art and asset art. And yeah, it's just definitely something I always tell people because I know as, a, as someone trying to get into the industry, it's very easy to kind of think like, oh God, I need to try and get a job. So I see like there's magicians for art art, environment art, 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 art. Um, it's better just to stay focused on tunnel vision on a specific area and just apply for that. And I feel like, you know, I just if you're applying for uh, multiple positions in a studio, I feel like it would probably leave a bad impression in the studio's room. Um, yeah, so it's always better just to just really, you know, focus on a specific area. 
So next we have the M4 Tactical Shotgun. The one thing that stood out about this that I really liked was a lot of the engraving detail. I thought it was really, really cool. Um, although I do feel like the general kind of wear and tear could just, it, it, you know, there's definitely a lot of love that could have been put into that. I feel when it comes to, to doing presentation shots, I think it's always important not to have any of this like background detail of just like the smoke and the sparks and stuff because it really kind of pulls away from what it is you're trying to present. Um, yeah, I think it's better just if you have like just a black background or maybe like a you know a gray or a white depending on the materials. Sometimes if you're using like like this shotgun here, if you were to put a white on the background, it'll probably like it would just kind of pull away from the details where if you have a black background you know the viewer's eyes can rest specifically on the object that you're present presenting to them um yeah i mean so for like i can see that there's a lot of wear and tear in the barrel what i always say is when you're making stuff like this it's always so important to look at reference detail and to create like a mood board of reference also maybe shotguns other m4 tacticals that you really really like and you could kind of just sit down and be like okay so you know what does the edge wear look like around the barrel and um, you know is there any staining from maybe when the, the round exits the barrel and um, you know the round comes out of the chamber just stuff like that it's just because more that you can copy that one-to-one -one, the more that you're really presenting high quality realistic art because as we know, games are getting more and more real. Um, so the quality bar kind of has to match that. And yeah, I feel like if you're, especially if you're doing something like a gun, it's just much better to um, just make sure that you're really using for, like real life reference imagery. I mean, overall the shape and silhouette is really nice. Like your modeling skills are really good. I just feel like the texture work could just use a little bit more push and love, and I think it's 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 very close. And so I can see here we can see the topology, and I guess the question I would have is, so it's eight thousand polygons, so and two K texture map. So I guess the question I have is, did you bake this from a high poly mesh, or did you just mold it out and kind of texture on top? Um, I think it's important to always make sure that you do a high poly for this stuff because chances are it's always going to be a hero prop and it requires more details and just doing a high poly really lets you get a lot of that detail in um, and I just kind of feel you know the engravings I can see that probably was done in ZBrush which is really nice you know don't get me wrong and I think personally I'm one to rather do that stuff in the high poly than stamp it in painter because I feel like if you do it in Painter, it's just going to look a lot flatter than if it was actually baked from the high poly mesh. Because you get a lot of nicer like AO detail, normal detail, curvature detail, and just reads much better. And you can see this guy up here, you know, you can see the grains flow in the right direction. Although I would query that maybe this is metal rather than wood. As I feel like because it's close to the chamber of contact where the actual round comes out, I feel like the heat would probably maybe set it on fire or just kind of ruin it. And I can see on the low poly that this guy here is quite dense. Um, I mean, I assume that the this either contributes to the 8,000 triangles or maybe the 8,000 poly, sorry, is the shotgun itself minus this guy. I'd probably, I think it's cool that you have these wee trinkets on it. I think that's a really cool touch. Although I'd probably go in and just really optimize this guy down, probably bake it from a high poly and just bake the eyes in, you know, the uh, the jacket, the jeans, just get all that into the normal map instead. Because if you think about it, you you have all these like additional polys in this little guy. But then if you look at the weapon itself, you can see there is slight flexing going on on the edges, and especially around this guy here. Considering that this weapon would be always so close to the camera, it's always important to remember that you know you could probably push this sh shotgun to probably like twenty k twice and that would be reasonable for a current AAA game maybe even 35k you know whatever gets you the highest resolution on your geometry without any faceting on curve like circular or cylinder objects and um, it's better to shoot for that but overall i mean it's definitely on the right track like you you, you can see the hard work and dedication in your craft and it, it's great you know i just feel like just with a bit more focus and just a bit more hard work um, you'll definitely be hitting that point. 
so the decrypted file with Fanpy and France Connector. So I think when it comes to um, the poly limit, it's that's a hard one because as we know, um, you know, you have Unreal Engine 4, Unreal Engine 5, and it really kind of just puts us in a position now where um, you know, you really kind of have situations where Price count is probably almost not going to matter anymore with the next gen consoles, which is a blessing as an artist. But it's also very important to always remember the fundamentals and to remember how important it is to optimize your mesh. So what I would say is add as much as you need to until you get the shapes you want. And as to make sure that there is no faceting or jagged edges visible. Um, once you hit that point you know you've enough and if you need to spend a little bit more on areas that are more visible to the camera such as like maybe the back of the gun you know chamfered edges and um, by all means but just always remember if there is edge loops and stuff like edge loops existing on your mesh that don't affect the silhouette they don't need to be there when i say that i mean let's say you have a cylinder and you know, in the center of that cylinder, there is a, an edge loop, you know, and you have the outer edge loops that actually have like defined cylinder shape. You can probably delete the middle edge loop because it's not doing anything to the silhouette shape. So that's kind of how I approach it. I would add all the detail in, you know, once you get the mesh and the model looking good, then I'd start to pull back and optimize where you need to. And you would kind of hit a point then where you know you kind of know i mean usually sometimes in studios you would work with the engineering or graphics team and they would kind of say to you okay so this is this is how expensive all this is to be on screen you know this is kind of what we're hoping for as a budget for x y and z and thankfully with the loading tools we have now and the technology of that if you have to create a really high dense high poly mesh sorry high poly but just like a mid poly like it's, it's low poly but the extra geometry the loading system for example in unreal can really crunch that down once the camera comes further and further from the object but it's always important just to think of it that way and to not necessarily have like a sub d mesh in engine and um, chances are you probably will never need that I'm not to worry on the, the zebra file. I think um, honestly, the more like you can show up your high poly models as well, the more inside studios will have, and they can kind of see your approach to the high poly modeling process. And um, you know, I would also say you know, like having your UVs as well. Um, you know, because I mean, it'd be interesting because the studio could see, oh, does she mirror UVs? Does she kind of like, for example, the barrel? You know, is the left mirror to the right? You know, maybe the sides where the, the grips are, where you have the engravings, you know, is it just flipped over geometry or just each of those have their own UV islands. And showing that stuff, it really helps the studio kind of understand where you are and maybe if they can kind of accommodate getting you to maybe where you need to be. It's just really good info as a junior. And next we have this um, Beretta. So I remember I actually I checked this out in the live stream. I believe it was like two, three live streams ago. And I think multiple points I made was very much um you know the wood grain here. I can see that there's a lot of this like kind of vertical grain and I don't know if this is maybe just like that you're trying to define like edge damage and edge wear. But I don't ever feel like edge damage or edge wear on something like this would be as uniform and consistent across. I feel it would just be slight chips and dings just kind of here and there around anywhere that really makes contact with any other surface you know maybe the holster maybe place it on a table just stuff like that i would probably avoid using like these screws because i know these are like substance painter screws but it would probably be better just kind of bake this down from a high poly you know maybe shrink it down a little bit as well it just feels quite big this detail here is really nice. I can see there's a little spot missing here. I'm assuming this was just painted in the painter. And um, probably important just to go back and just kind of add that part. Overall, like, I mean, the, the shape and geometry is really nice, but I feel what you, like, we can see that the trice count is 3,789. You probably could probably push this to probably about 8 or 9K. So I would probably go back and just really spend that extra geometry on, on these edges. So we can remove a lot of this like general disfaceting that's occurring because again when it comes to weapons they are like the most 
to take up the most screen space, especially during animations, like loading and you're aiming and firing the weapon. So a lot of the stuff has to be just really high quality. So that would be feedback number one, which is go back, you know, smoothing out your edges. Um, I would reduce these sprues, you know, kind of just revisit this edge where, you know, I can see there's like slight shading happening here. You know, I probably, if I was you, I'd probably go back back and just like kind of improve the high poly mesh and just make this so you can get rid of the smoothing shading error. You can see there's a lot of just general edge wear, which is really nice, but I feel on a weapon like this, the edge wear probably wouldn't be consistent across the entire mesh. I'd probably just kind of pull it back in areas, add it in others, and kind of just really areas that make sense, you know, so maybe like this outer section here, you know, maybe it, you could bring this down a little bit, just let the roughness do a lot of kind of the, the detail on the metal. And um, maybe some like finger smudges as well would be really cool, especially on the trigger. And maybe just some general edger along the front of the pistol is maybe that's where it's made contact with walls or just tables and yeah, but otherwise it's definitely on the right track. It's looking really, really good. And again, I would probably avoid using a lot of this kind of like detail, like the smoke and the sparks and stuff, because I just feel like it really pulls away from the quality of the asset. As when you, a studio is reviewing your portfolio, they want to kind of look at the asset on screen rather than just a lot of that detail. Again, your topology is nice. And I mean, you can see how you're optimizing your cylinder sections. You're not having just like vertical edge lifts. You know, you have one point in the center and you just have all them connected. So like those little techniques are very important to get optimized geometry. But again, overall, you're definitely on the right track. Like your portfolio is really going in the right direction. So if it was me, I would probably if I was to do these screws, I would probably have them part of the high poly. So I just I bring them down by 20%. I just model either A model using Boolean and ZBrush. I create a hole in the actual handle section and just insert the screw so you get like that screw big with the hole. You get that nice AO and curvature on it. Or you could just have it as floating geo. But one tip for you guys is if you ever have floating geometry make sure that there's not a lot of space between that piece of geometry and the object behind it. Otherwise, you end up with like this just odd shadow around the exterior of it. And that's because what happens is when you have floating geometry and you do a bake, it's going to be calculating AO that's behind that floating geo. So it's just something to keep in mind. But personally, I always, for me, I always prefer to have it as a part of the high poly mesh rather than being floating geometry. Although floating geometry is a much less um, destructive workflow if alliterations need to be made. So you can either A, just have your high poly grip exception, you know, and then you duplicate it over and then you do your edits. So you know that if you have to make any changes, the original's there. Or you just do one and then you add your floating geo and it's just another alternative option. So next we have the Happy Halloween wrist cart, which I think is really cool. I like these wee ghosts. And even the signage is so nice. It's like really well done. I like the little drips to come off it. I just, I can feel like this is just like a, like a 3D bake that you did and you just kind of add an emissive texture. It, it looks really, really nice. And I think like the pumpkin guy is really cute as well. I'd say the one thing that stands out to me is like these drips. I feel like they're very uniform across the entire um, cauldron. I probably would kind of pull back on this and sort of just have details where like, maybe they're more prevalent in areas than others. You know, maybe there's like subtle drip stains in other sections and then other parts have like these larger stripes going down. I think it's really cool that you have sort of this like ivy growing on like the legs and the, underneath the cauldron. That's a really nice touch. The pumpkins are really nice. I feel like they're just a little kind of too scaled inwards. I probably would have kind of kept the original shape, or maybe they're just a bit more, um, just a bit wider. I think it's a really nice touch. But I feel like I feel for this guy that maybe if we think about animation, you know, when you have these pumpkin guys rotating, you know, what way does that affect the animation? Does this rock around a lot? 
Um, I mean, assuming that there's a lot of drip stains, that kind of tells me that this probably moves a lot during um, the vehicle moving. And again, don't be afraid to add dirt and detail just around kind of sections where it may gather. You know, maybe around the base of the pumpkin, as you have here, there's just some dirt and muck. I think the material on the pumpkin is really nice. It reads really well. And the one thing I always say to people is try add as much as you can between two objects that attach. Because if you do that, it makes it feel like things are connected a lot nicer. And otherwise, sometimes it can feel like they're just floating. So it's just something else to keep in mind. Trasher's race car. Like this stuff is so cool. It's just there's a lot of personality in this stuff and a lot of creativity. And it's you can see kind of where you took something that's real, but you've added your own kind of spin on it. And I think that's really impressive. And it reminds me of kind of the stuff you would see in like Dead Mice's music videos. It's kind of like this guy here. It's, it's pretty cool. So I like that you have these decals, the rosy mommy. So I guess the question I would have is, the DVs with this guy is like, I'm assuming the front and the back aren't mirrored. Considering that these are in the front, there's no one that in the back. You could probably, if I was to approach this, what I probably would do is, because you want to try and get as much resolution as you can out of the texture size you're using. So I probably would have went ahead and mirrored the front with the back, you know, with the right with the left, because you have to remember, the player is never going to see two sides of an object at once. But in doing that, if you were to have these graffiti decals as a part of the texture, they're going to be inverted on the other side. So I probably would have created a separate texture sheet for those guys and just have them as decals, basically floating planes in front of it that are UV to a texture sheet containing those details. I know you could probably do the same with the left and right as well, just a lot of those like text detail you could probably get away with. I think the the, light, the wheels are really cool. I'm assuming like these are like bin loads. Although I can see there's a lot of like faceting on the handle, you know, just check with smoothing groups. And I'd probably bake a lot of this stuff down from the high poly as well, instead of making it like just topology. You know, maybe smoothing out just this cylinder section on the back so there's not like this visible fastening occurring. You know, I'd probably have like the grill section on the back as like a alpha instead of it being geometry. Overall, it's, it's definitely on the right track. It's looking really, really good. Yeah, cool. And here we can see there's a wireframe as well. That's nice. So yeah, I probably would do that. I just, you know, smoothing out the cylinder section more at the back. And you could probably get away, because if you think about it, the players never going to see the side of these guys or see like the front section. So you could just have these as just either A and a flat plane going down and across, or you could just have it as just a texture where maybe it's just a floating card in front, just like this detail in, in Alpha. Again, I don't think it's important when you show this stuff just to show your high poly as well, because it allows the studio to kind of see where you utilize the high poly for the additional details and where you maybe compromise with that on the low poly as well. But, I mean, the creative thought behind this stuff is really nice. Awesome. And I can see here that we have these little guys, the bottles and the wooden pallet. The bottles are really cool. I like the graphics on it. It's really cool. But I feel like the dirt is just, it's quite heavy and displaced. And um, if I was to do this, I would probably have the middle sections a little cleaner for readability as they're quite noisy and if you think about it, if you had a lot of these guys on screen and you're at a distance from them you would really kind of that would add up in noise on screen so i probably went and just add some little dirt just under the ridges in the front and the bottom and top and um, maybe just some general edge wear you know along the edges maybe just some like hue coloration to the barrel material itself so you got like this red but maybe just make it like, a little brighter in areas maybe just maybe there's chip paint and maybe it was repainted you know, just some of those like this 
Um, I do like that you have this guy and then you have ones with different kind of details on them, which is really nice. But again, I just kind of maybe pull back on all this detail and just maybe have it around the bottom section as you do where maybe it's been placed on something. And the wooden palette's nice, I guess. Do you have any other screen shots of that? Yeah, so if I was to do the wooden palette, what I probably would do is just, I'd probably go in and do a high poly for this because I can see in the top and part and bottom, it's very much low poly mesh, which is like UV'd and then textured with a wood. And I'd probably go in and just kind of, you know, again, when you're creating a mesh like this, because there's so many plants on it, that can take up so much space on your UVs, especially when you're trying to hit a good resolution. So one tip would be to like, maybe have three variants of the wooden plank that goes like horizontal, and then have a variant or two variants of the planks that go vertical, and just create your high poly meshes do your low poly, do your UVs, bake the high poly detail down because it means you can run the ZBrush then and you can add a lot of like just dings and dings and broken wood chunks and just a lot of personality to it. And it means then you can bring it into um, 3ds Max when you do your bakes or Maya and then you can basically assemble the actual palette just with the wood variants you have. So when doing that you're saving a lot of texture resolution because you're not using up as much UV space. Um, and it allows you to get variation. Maybe you want to add a fully constructed palette, but maybe you want one that has the middle wood section missing. Maybe there's parts that's broken. The studios a lot would ask for, if they were to do a wooden palette mesh for a game, typically they would ask for variants. So when they're set dressing, they just get a lot of that variant and scene. So things don't feel as uniform and it's just like the same repeating mesh. So it's just, just something to keep in mind. Just present a working on Real instead of Marmoset a plus for portfolio for characters. I'd say if you were to, I'd say either way, it doesn't matter. Because if you think about it, Marmoset is basically an engine in itself. Um, you can render your 3D programs, you can import textures and meshes, set them up in the material. So it's basically as if you were doing it on in Unreal. Um, I'd say the only time you would probably add it in Unreal is if you wanted to kind of present some of the technical stuff. So maybe like LODs for the character, you know, kind of showing maybe how much material or texture sets you're utilizing for, and even the collusion as well. And but honestly, I'd say like it's completely fine to present high quality art in Marmoset. And you know, you can always do your high quality or yeah, both your high quality renders and your wireframe shots in it as well. And um, yeah, perfectly fine. I mean, all of the stuff on my website is all done in Marmoset. I mean, it's it's wonderful. The guys at Marmoset are fantastic. And again, you have the trash pile, which is really nice. Like, I love kind of just like the layout and decoration and just like the variant in it. It's just so well done. And um, I feel like these trash bags just feel a little too inflated or bubbly. I feel like they're missing a lot of the crease detail and noise. So I'd probably go back to your high poly and add that. Or alternatively, if you've ever used Marvelous Designer, there's tutorials on YouTube that you could learn to basically have like a simulated trash bag and just to get a lot of those creases and folds in. Because I feel like when the light's hitting this, it's just, it feels more like a balloon in the trash bag. But overall, I mean, it's definitely on the right track, like, especially the cardboard, I really like it. One thing I would probably add if I was doing the cardboard would kind of just be some subtle coloration changes in the center points. So maybe like you have the darker cardboard, but either A, you have, it becomes more slightly colored, or it's already lightly colored in the center or on the edges. Just to make it feel more lived in. And your dumpsters are really, really nice. Although again, I feel like with a lot of this stuff, it would be a really good idea to kind of just do a high poly and bake it all down. And if these are high poly, as I can see in the top section here, I feel like these edges are, I would probably inflate the edges on it just a little bit more so they don't feel as sharp from a distance. Because as I always say on the licenses, the further you get from an object, the pixels get smaller. And if you have a lot of that like, beveled edges in your normal detail it will kind of stop aliasing issues 
so you won't really get that flickering kind of issue on screen. Um, and honestly, the more kind of technical knowledge you have of that, the more beneficial it, not only the more beneficial is it in your application, but it really helps kind of when it comes to maybe programmers, engineers, um, technical artists trying to find out solutions. It just it makes their life a lot easier. And um, plus, personally, I feel when you really kind of smooth and inflate your edges in high poly, I just feel it reads so much nicer in the low poly image. But overall, chill I like this stuff is really on the right direction. And I'm, I'm super impressed with what I see. It's looking really good. I just feel with a lot of those little feedback notes, I feel like you'll be really kind of hitting the quality bar required. And one thing I'd always say is when you guys graduate, if if you're not getting application interviews or you feel like your work's not just quite there yet, honestly, I would not worry or stress because the thing is, I feel like with universities, they really do teach you the fundamentals and they do such a wonderful job. But I feel like sometimes you just really have to kind of just push that a little bit further to just get your portfolio up to scratch. So if it means spending an additional three to six months outside the university, if it means you landing a junior job at a studio that you absolutely love, it's absolutely worth it. So I just definitely wouldn't stress over that. But overall, yeah, I mean, again, the lighting is really nice. The presentation is really nice. You know, it's very thought through, you know, your layout, you can really see that you've sat down and modeled out variants and kind of really thought, okay, like what, what do these rooms represent and what does this layout represent? And again, you know, when it comes to environment art for games, um, creating the assets is one side of it, you know, helping the level, taking the level designer's block out and doing a proxy class where you're maybe modeling in just a little bit more detail to the archways and tables, you know, and then once that's approved, then you move to archways, which is like you start to actually create the assets and have them set up an engine. So the fact that you can really present the lighting and set dressing is an absolute plus. Because I mean, studios could uh, lean on me for a lot of that detail as well and a lot of that help. Because as we know, games are getting bigger and it's going to require more people on them. So the more that one person can kind of do in a specific area they focus on, the better. So this this was another asset I was looking at, and I thought it was really nice, but I feel like there's just a lot of areas that can just do with a little bit of work. And it was really down to these columns. I noticed you have texture sets for each of these guys and i feel like if you were to construct an asset like this for a game it would very much um not be composed of this many texture sets and especially if these are decals that are placed either on top of the mesh or in your texture sets i feel like this is just very expensive so what we would probably do is if you were creating this for a game more than likely what would happen is you would use a mid-poly workflow where you just add extra chamfers and, and geometry for the edges and you UV, UV the sky to a tileable paint concrete material and that's how it will go into an engine. And then next you will come back and you can, I mean, that can also include applying additional material IDs if you want to apply some brass to sections. It just means that you're essentially paying for two material called textures each per set, which is a lot cheaper than that amount, for example. And another, what you probably would do next is once you have this situated an engine with the basic materials applied, you would then go in and add your decals. And this could be done two ways, depending on the workflow and the engine that the studio would use. So either A, you could have a texture atlas sheet containing all these decal details and it has an alpha channel to it which means they could all be packed really tightly together but once you UV it to the alpha it only presents what's inside the alpha so example the text itself in doing this it means you re a your resolution on these guys are going to be a lot higher because you're pulling from a single high resolution texture set and B, it's not going to be as expensive as having these in your albedo or diffuse texture. And another option is you could be using Unreal and you can model this object out 
do your mid-party workflow, you view it to tile and materials, and then you could go in and use Unreal's decal system, and maybe each of these fonts have their own texture. So they're just they're literally their own texture, and you're just plastering this with decals. That's another option. And if you're thinking, oh, I want to have this in multiple areas in my scene, but I know that if I was to place an object here, apply all the decals, it's going to be a nightmare to try to select all those decals and mesh and move it. In Unreal, you can set up blueprints and you can set up a blueprint system where basically you create a blueprint from a mesh and you just add all those decals and it becomes one defined thing. So then you can basically just, you know, copy paste and it just makes your life so much easier. But overall, I mean, your work is definitely on the right track. You know, your, your, your kind of your dedication to your craft and your time spent really shows. So it definitely doesn't fall short. But I just feel with a lot of that kind of just little feedback and just sort of kind of taking those technical notes into consideration, I feel like this is really close, like very close. And as always, if you have any questions, just reach out over Discord, and I'm always available on the Game Vault channel. And yeah, I look forward to seeing your future work. So next we have Camille from Seattle. Um, she shared her portfolio on Discord, and I think it's it's looking really really nice. Let's check out this vehicle. So roller coaster car vehicle, render in Substance Painter. Okay, cool. So we can see this is texture in Substance Painter. This is your high poly. Yeah, big in the high poly to low poly. So that's really nice. So you can see that you have a lot of this nice curvature in your edges. And I feel like doing high poly renders like this is so nice because what it does is it really kind of shows where the light hits and it shows that either A, on your high poly mesh or on your big mesh with the normal map. And it's just always good to show that along with your textures. And again, this is a really good example to showing your UV layout, kind of showing the checkers on your mesh and kind of to see the density of it. I mean, when I look at your um, UVs, I have a few feedback notes and the first is always make sure that you can straighten out your UVs and just like like this guy here if you straighten this out a your bake will be a lot nicer and b sometimes what happens is if you have a mesh um and you planar map that mesh and it gives you like this kind of wriggly UV layout it can actually lead to like distortion when you do your bake so you'll get this alien issue or alien alien issue. So if you zoom in on your normal map after you bake it, you know this will be like jagged edges that run along the edge. That's because you have the UV layer like this. I'm not sure technically why that happens, but if you straighten that UV out, it actually it fixes that issue and avoids it. So it's just something to keep in note. And I think it's cool here that you have this mesh here and then you have the back section. I like that you have just duplicated this mesh and you haven't actually added further UV islands because I feel like, again, that would decrease the resolution of the asset. But I feel like with the layout, you could probably optimize this just a little bit more. And I feel like these shapes up here are just kind of taking up a lot of UV space that maybe if you were to flip them rotationally left or right, you could probably kind of squeeze more in and kind of be able to kind of just bring the resolution up a little bit. And for example, when it comes to these seats, you know, one tip could be in the center point, you could you could basically marry these guys. So for example, in the center of this chair, um, because the details are very much the same as they are on the left one, as they are on the right, you could probably get away with actually just having one, like, one section of this EV so like you basically take it, you cut it down the center, you delete the right section, you read the left section, and then you symmetrically flip it over and weld it. So you have a full chair that basically is just half of it is UV'd and it's basically mirrored on top. And if you bake, or sorry, if you weld your vertices before you bake, you won't get any seam down the center of it. But the only thing you do need to keep an eye out for is the butterfly effect, which basically means that in the center of the edge that is mirrored, for example, in the middle of the seat, 
if you add any dirt around that, it's going to replicate like a butterfly. So I think when you're doing details like that and tricks like that, always keep the edge wear and detail that you add away from that edge that is basically mirrored because it just avoids that. Yeah, exactly. I just think, like, honestly, I feel because from from experience working on games, um, I mean, for example, I worked on Dying Light 2, and they really, really harped on this because the thing is, if you think about it, you have an open world game, you have thousands of assets being drawn on screen, and a lot of them can't have 2K or 4K textures for memory reasons. So you're probably looking at 256 by 256 or 512. Now, with Unreal Engine 5, I can very well change. So I think the general tip is only use unique movies if you need to for details, for font, for text, for logos. If, if you don't, and you can get away with just having a basic fabric mesh or material on it, basic metal material, you know, maybe a plastic with a grainy effect, you're not going to need multiple UVs for that. Or for example, like this fall chair section, you could probably get away with half of that. You know, and the same with this guy here, you know, this rectangle, and it has the edge loop in the center. If you ever have an object like object like this, it will allow, it actually presents the opportunity for you to actually go in and just flip this down and mirror those UVs. Because what this does is it basically saves you a chunk of UV space. And you could probably fit a bunch of these other guys in there that then allows you to actually scale your islands up. You know, same with this guy here, you could probably go in and just, you know, put it in the center here and just UV it. So instead of it being a full mesh, it's just half of it. So it's just definitely something to keep in mind. But this is definitely on the right track. And I think these kind of presentation shots are extremely important when it comes to applying for jobs because it shows your high poly, it shows your wireframe, it shows your low poly with the UVs, and then your textured asset and substance painter. And then even in Unity, like you have the painter shot and then you have the engine or the engine version of it. So that stuff is super beneficial because it just it shows the studio your full workflow your full kind of, sorry, your work, full workflow, your full kind of um, process from start to finish. And it, it gives them kind of like an insight to how you approach this stuff. When to use layered materials? That's a good question. I mean, it depends on what it is you're working on, what you're trying to accomplish. For example, you could use layered, layered materials on an asset like this inside a single texture set in something there. So, you know, selecting material A, select, I'm painting material B on top of that and C on top of that. Another alternative option is, let's say you're in Unreal and you have um, a building and you have a brick material, a concrete material, and maybe a painted concrete material. And you're like, okay, I want this building to be green. I want it to be exposed concrete or sorry, concrete with the bricks coming through. I think a good idea is to, you can either approach that in two ways. The first way is you add additional edge loops and you set up a two or three layer, two or three material layer shader system on Unreal. And you paint using the RGB values and you can paint a lot of those different materials through the mesh. And you can find a lot of, tutorial, a lot of those tutorials on YouTube. An alternative one would be very much, um, you could create a mask system in substance painter. So for example, when it comes to baking high poly meshes, you can create a mask where you highlight certain parts of the high poly meshes like blue, green, yellow, and then you bake a texture that basically has all that detail on it, that info. And then you can use that as like a color picker in painter to say, okay, everywhere there's red, I want it to be metal. You can kind of take that approach in Painter where, for example, you could basically have your building, you could paint in, you could have the whole building with red, paint green where you maybe want brick to show, paint blue where you want concrete to show. You could export that as a mass texture and set it up on Unreal and tell Unreal, okay, again, you know, anywhere that's red is a, a yellow painted concrete, 
um, anywhere that's green, there's brick coming through and blue there's concrete. So there's definitely multiple ways you can approach that. It really just comes down to optimization and comes down to texture density, texture resolution, and how many material draw calls you can get away with. In the and again, when you play the studios, a lot of them may use, for example, Unreal. They have a lot of their own custom workflows. So this guy's really cool. I like the geometry, I like the shape, the shape and so on. It's really nice. You can see that you used all the materials. This is a really good call, a very fast and non structured way to do something. And a lot of games do this as well. Um, if this, you know, if you think about it, you know, you have this guy here, and um, he's a statue in a hallway, and there's multiple variants of it. It would be actually cheaper to set it up as such rather than having unique textures on it. So, for example, you could maybe Maybe you have four variants of this, and you're like, okay, on variant one, it's white, you know, the white's maybe red, and then maybe it's blue on another. And what you can do is you can just use tiles and materials on it, and then you can just apply, you know, instance variant color variant to that an engine. Well, no, that's really cool. I think it's really good. Which was pairing your adjustments? I'm wondering if it's all cool. Yeah. Otherwise, it's really good, really good work there. This is really cute as well. This is looking really, really good. I mean, your, your stuff is definitely in the right direction. And, you know, I like that you have some 2D concepts up here as well. Although, the one thing I would say is, if, you're, if you present yourself as an environment artist, I think it's just very important to have your portfolio specifically tailored to that as it really kind of it's just i feel adding a lot of this additional stuff would kind of pull away from your best environment work and you know if a studio needs to hire an environment artist they're going to have hundreds of applicants and if they pull your portfolio up they can be like oh wow yeah like this plant looks awesome you know the roller coaster car mm -hmm. but then when they get to this point it's like you know characters tileable material concept art it just it kind of it can kind of make them sort of be like okay well where what is it she wants to, to work as and um, so i think it's always important you know i mean for your concept stuff you could always have like a blog set up or kind of like another maybe portfolio specifically for that like oh here's my like in my free time i do like 2d art and um, i mean as an artist it's always good to be pushing yourself and improving your craft and doing 2d stuff really helps to define and craft and kind of just really push your eye for detail but i think when it comes to portfolio applicants and um, it's important just to have it specifically focused on an area instead. And the rough or the brick texture looks really nice as well. So I'd say if this was done in designer, one thing I would say is it would be good to see, you know, kind of like your node layout of how you approach this. You know, maybe if you used any custom like alphas and shapes you created in Photoshop, maybe just a kind of clear kick clay version of it where it doesn't have like the correlation on it. Anything that you can kind of add to sort of sell what it is you've created, um, I think is always very important. Little draw, yeah, wonderful work. I mean, again, I'm looking forward to seeing where, um, where this leads you. And, you know, I wish you the best in your endeavors. But... Okay, well, that, that's it all for today, today's live stream. And I really appreciate you guys tuning in. And um, again, I'm always inspired and blown away by the work I see. And, you know, I can see how hard you guys work in the art that you create. But just always remember that on Discord, on your game phones, I'm always available. I'm always there if you have any questions or want me to do work. And during the week at any point, just reach out. Well, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Friday. And thank you so much for tuning in.